Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone from Los Angeles, and good morning to our attendees in the Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, and other morning locations. Before we start, we would like to recognize that as a land-grant institution, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrieleno Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of Tovangar, the Los Angeles Basin, and Southern Channel Islands. So welcome everyone to session two of our webinar series, Natural Resource Policy, Culture, and Law. Today's session's title is Resource Management Across Traditional Lands and Waters. I would like to invite our attendees to use the Q&A feature here on Zoom to pose your questions. We will have time at the end of everyone's presentation to address all the questions. If you're watching on Facebook Live, you're welcome to leave your questions in the comments section. And if you're watching the later YouTube video, you're welcome to email us any questions or inquiries you might have. I'd like to now briefly introduce our four panelists. First, we have Anne McCammon Soltis from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission for her presentation, Treaty Guaranteed Rights in the Upper Great Lakes, Tribal Governance and Intergovernmental Relationships. Next, we will have Professor Curtis Jaiichi Pei from the Institute of Wildlife Conservation, National Pingtung University of Science and Technology with a presentation titled, Toward the Self-Governance of Indigenous Hunting in Taiwan. Our third presenter will be Mohihiro Ichikawa, um, who is a lawyer in Hokkaido in Council for the Ainu Tribes from the Taumau Law Office with the title presentation, Comments from the Perspective of the Japan Japan's I Knew Salmon Case. And our fourth and final presenter will be Tiffany Chisholm Gardner from the University of Western Australia, recognizing the strengths in first law co-governance as a strategy for water decolonization. Our moderator today is Professor Mitsuhiko Taka Takahashi from Toyama University. And with that, I will hand the floor over to Professor Mitsuhiko for the remainder of the session. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, good morning. I'm Mitsu Takahashi from Toyama, Japan. And um, I, uh, my specialty is in wildlife law and environmental law. And I'm very excited to uh, hear the uh, presentations today. And uh, since the time is running, uh, we will want to start from uh, with presentation, the first presentation. The first presenter will be Anne McCammon Saltis. Uh, she's an attorney and the director of the Division of Intergovernmental Affairs with the Great Lake Indian uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission in Wisconsin. And she's been working with Glyphic uh, and its member tribes for over 25 years on such issues as sulfur mining in lakes uh, and lakes uh, superior protection and restoration. Well, I uh, visited Glyphic uh, several years ago. Uh, I think I visited twice and uh, uh, she's doing a great job there. And her presentation will be uh, Treaty Guaranteed Rights in the Upper Great Lakes, Tribal Governance and Intergovernmental Relationship. So please, Anne, uh, your stage. Thank you so much, appreciate it. And let me see if I can share my screen properly here. And... Okay, does that look like you can see everything? Okay, good. Uh, well, good morning or good afternoon or here it's evening. So good evening, um, everyone. I appreciate you joining this session. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, the treaty guaranteed rights um, of our member tribes. I work for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission or GLIFWIC as we call it for short. Um, and we are an intertribal agency of 11 tribes. And those tribes signed treaties with the United States government. This map shows you um, the treaty seated areas. If you're not totally familiar with the geography of the United States, if you look down here, hopefully you can see the little finger pointing. The south end of Lake Michigan is where the city of Chicago is. Milwaukee is a little bit north. Minneapolis is over here, Detroit is over here, and we're up here where it snows a lot. 
Um, so you can see that the years of the various treaties that the tribes signed with the United States government, where they ceded the land or sold the land in these areas. And the Treaty of 1854, they also reserved homelands or reservations for themselves. And so the little red um, areas on the map are, are, are member tribes reservations. Oh, next. Hmm. Why are we not going to the next slide here? Hang on. Okay, that's much better. So this is these are some examples of the language that was included in the treaties um, with our member tribes. And so you can see in the Treaty of 1837, the treaty explicitly talks about the privilege of hunting, fishing, and gathering the wild rice on the lands, the rivers, and the lakes included in the territory ceded is guaranteed to the Indians. And then there's similar language in the Treaty of 1842. So we've got these tribes and they signed these treaties. So what do they need with an intertribal agency like Glyphwick? We were established in 1984 to assist our member tribes in affirming and implementing their ceded territory rights. And so we, um, conserve and manage off-reservation fish, wildlife, and other resources. And it's important to emphasize that this is off-reservation. Each tribe has its own natural resources department and takes care of its own reservation. Um, but we provide that intertribal coordination off, off the reservation. Um, we assist our tribes in developing the institutions that allow them to be self-regulatory. So the tribes are not regulated by state law. They're regulated by their own law. And then we also work to protect um, the habitats and the ecosystems that support those natural resources that the tribes reserve the right to, um, to harvest. So there have been a number of uh, court cases in these three states that have reaffirmed tribal treaty rights. And what those cases generally have found is that tribes can regulate themselves to the exclusion of other governments, including the states and sometimes the federal government, if they protect legitimate interests in the conservation of species and in health and safety. And so we have three primary cases in our region um, that have slightly different mechanisms to um, ensure that ensured the courts that the tribes would be would properly regulate themselves. So the U.S. v. Michigan case, as you can guess, that was in took place in Michigan. Um, the Lacoudre versus Wisconsin case and the Millax versus Minnesota cases. So cases that cover the three states in which we operate. So one of the interesting things about these treaties is that even though each tribe signed the treaty individually because each tribe has regulatory jurisdiction over its members, the tribes also signed the treaties collectively. They shared the ceded territory resources and so they all signed together the treaty. And so this really requires that the tribes um, coordinate intertribally so that they make sure that they stay within their share of the available resources. So if, if you have a quota of 100 animals and each tribe is issuing 15 permits um, without being intertribally coordinated, you can see how you might easily go over the, um, the, the tribe's allocation. And so one of the things that, one of the pieces of sovereignty that our tribes have delegated to us is the ability to actually shut down harvest if it's necessary um, for the tribes to stay within their quota. Um, so this, this is a little bit more about um, the regulatory aspects that the tribes reserved um, as sovereigns. The, the courts said that they need to um, have regulatory authority over their members, which all our member tribes do. They need to enact regulations that both conserve natural resources and protect public health and safety. And then they need to cooperate and share information and share data with other governments that are also managers of those same, same natural resources. And so tribes have to have laws, they have to have science, they have to have enforcement, and they have to have courts. 
And Glyphwick helps them make sure that they can meet all those requirements. So um, Glyphwick, we work very hard to make sure that we have intertribal consensus regarding ceded territory rights when we interact with other decision makers, states or the federal government. Um, we have um, a committee that meets once a month and is meeting tomorrow, as a matter of fact, to talk about um, walleye declarations for fishing this spring in lakes within the ceded territory. And there are times when there is a quota of say 50 fish and two tribes will make declarations that they each wanna take 50 fish. And that doesn't work because that goes over the, uh, the, the tribal share. And so we, one of our jobs is to fill, facilitate the consensus so that they can get together and decide, okay, you know, we're gonna horse trade and you're gonna take 25 fish and I'm gonna take 25 fish or you're gonna take 30 and I'm gonna take 20, whatever it ends up being. But we really facilitate the ability of tribes to engage in that intertribal coordination that's necessary. And so Glyphwick has biologists, we have conservation law enforcement um, who uh, uh, enforce tribal laws against tribal members into tribal courts. And then we have policy folks and attorneys like me that help draft tribal ordinances and the regulations um, that are necessary. It's not always recommend regulations. Sometimes it's agreements with other governments. We also have public information services and that's been really important in our history because when the tribes rights were first reaffirmed, there was a great deal of misinformation. There were protests at the boat landings where tribes were going to be fishing. There was violence. And we really needed to um, get the word out what the tribes were doing, that the tribes were not harming the resource, that the tribes were actually very strictly regulated, much more strictly regulated than a lot of the non-Indian folks. Um, and so public information services has always been a really core aspect of our job. The tribes really um, harvest a wide range of resources from the ceded territory, and they don't always tell us exactly what they're harvesting. There are certain medicines and other um, materials that they just don't share with us. But what they have told us is that if we help ensure that there's a broad array of healthy ecosystems in the ceded territory, then they will have the resources that they need even though we might not know what those are. And so they're really concerned about any environmental or land use issue that impacts those ecosystems. And so really um, interested in almost everything that happens within the ceded territory that affects the environment. And so we deal with that in a number of ways. We work closely with a lot of other governments, both state and federal um, on research so that we can bring good science to the policy table. Um, you know, we've certainly had times where other um, state or federal agencies don't think the tribes are sort of up to the challenge to produce good science. Um, I think over the years, they have rethought those positions because the tribes do bring good science to the table. Um, we do a lot of mercury research. Um, and we issue advice to our member tribes about what fish they can eat from which lakes in what amounts so that they can continue to eat fish, which is culturally very important, um, but without harming themselves or their children by eating too much mercury. We also uh, do quite a bit of water quality data collection. Um, we do research on things like martens, um, whole variety, whole variety of things. Um, so, you know, the courts have not really, at least in our area of the Great Lakes, made any kind of determination about whether the tribes, what power the tribes have to say stop a particular project because it would harm um, species or natural resources that the tribes are interested in. We don't know exactly, you know, how far that 
that habitat component of the treaty right goes. We do have um, language in some of the, the judicial decisions that talks about the state's management authority being significantly narrowed by the existence of the right and subject to judicial review. And so clearly the state has a has, has to do things other than what it might be free to do without the existence of the treaty right. So substantively, this is a gray area. Um, procedurally, it's a little more clear because we know that both the state and the federal government have to consult with tribes on a government to government basis. So in terms of federal consultation, you know, the, the tribes signed the treaties, but the United States government also signed the treaties. And so the treaties created an expectation by the tribes that the federal government would protect it to some degree from the newly forming states and that the federal government would guarantee that the tribes could continue to exercise their life way within the ceded territory. And that meant moving from place to place um, to for example, the sugar bush in the spring to um, the walleye lakes later on when the walleye were spawning um, to um, berry areas or wild rice lakes in the fall. Um, they, they were really trying to reserve that, that the continuation of that life way. And so we talked to the federal government a lot about their treaty obligations and um, have ask for them, and they do consult with the tribes when they are taking actions that may affect treaty resources. The state doesn't have the same obligations because it wasn't a, a treaty signatory, but when these rights were litigated, um, the courts found that the states also have to consult when they are taking actions that affect the ceded territory. Like I said earlier, their management decision is limited, but you know they won't know in, in what way it's limited unless they talk to the tribes and find out what their perspective is. So there are a couple of, of particular stipulations in the LCO versus Wisconsin case that provide specifically for consultation before the state issues any permit that would be expected to affect the abundance or habitat of wild rice or wild plants. And so those are very specific and, and pretty powerful agreements that we have with the state where we can really, you know, drag them in, even if they don't want to, even if they don't want to talk to the tribes because they've agreed that that they must. Tribes have representatives and sometimes they delegate that representation to Glyphwick. Um, on having seats on management committees that the state forms for all sorts of, of wildlife species. Um, and so the courts have said that the tribes need to have representation on those committees so that they can weigh in with the other managers about um, their thoughts, their desires, um, and, and how they would like to see these species managed to best protect tribal treaty rights. And I'll just apologize for the slide right up front because I know it has a lot of words on it, but really um, it's important because we really try to, regardless of who the actual final decision maker is, if we can come to a common understanding with that decision maker about how tribes view natural resources and their ties between resources and culture, if we can agree on the technicalities related to a particular proposed project, and then the specific impact, impacts of uh, that project on natural resources, then I think we set ourselves up well to perhaps reach consensus on the best way forward. We don't always reach consensus. Um, in some of the cases, there are, um, dispute resolution procedures laid out where the party who doesn't like the, the, the action the other one is gonna take can raise the, the issue up. Um, ultimately, the party who has the authority makes that decision. Um, we have put in some of our more recent agreements that they need to put in writing how they took tribal views into account. That's always very helpful. Um, and then ultimately, if the, if, 
the tribes, for example, think that a state is in its decision is going so far as to uh, impinge on their treaty right, they can take that, that other agency or that state back to court. Our tribes um, are very concerned about the ceded territory and in particular water and water quality. And so that means that they are usually very conservative when it comes to land use proposals. And they weigh in very regularly with state and federal agencies um, on things like environmental impact statements, making sure that they're well done, that they're rigorous, that they're, um, that they're, that baseline data is, is collected, that they're accounting for the most recent climate projections, um, and really um, holding any um, industry feet to the fire to design a project that impacts as little as possible on the resources that they depend on. So I think that's all the slides that I have. I don't think I went over. Nobody warned me that I was going over. So this is my contact information. I'm happy to um, you know, have you check out Glyphwick's website. You can find a whole lot more on there about um, the specific regulations that tribal members um, abide by when they're out in the ceded territory, a lot more about the research and some of the reports that we've written. Um, so I'd encourage you to check out our website. So miigwetch. Thank you, Anne, miigwetch. So um, that was a presentation of the, from the uh, Glyphic, uh, Glyphic's <coughs> work in, uh, in the Great Lakes. And just as for those who are not uh, familiar with the situation in America, well, um, just uh, in the States, um, when the United States government takes over the land from the uh, Indian tribes, or when the Indian tribes cedes the land uh, to the US government, they make a treaty. And the, the Indian tribes are uh, uh, a nation by itself. So the United States and the Indian nations make a treaty. And within that treaty, the Indians in the Great Lakes uh, reserve the rights to hunt and fish. Is that correct? <laughs> My understanding yes, is correct, right? That is 100% correct. Yeah. So thus, they have a treaty right on hunting and fishing. And, that's, and to exercise those rights, and they've set up this inter, uh, inter-tribal or inter-governmental mm -hmm. organization as Glyphic, where she works. I, I hope my understanding is correct. <laughs> it is absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. So uh, we do have a few more minutes before going to the next presentation. presentation. Of course, we're gonna take questions later, but if you have any questions like factual questions you want to ask right now, you're welcome to ask. Anyone needs to ask any questions? May I move to the second presentation? Okay, with the uh, participants. Okay, thank you. Then uh, let's, thank you, Anne, and uh, see you afterwards at the questioner. Uh, the presentation too is uh, from P Professor Curtis J. J. Pei uh, from the Institute of Wildlife Conservation at the National Pinkton University of Science and Technology. And his presentation will be towards the self-governance of indigenous hunting in Taiwan. And Professor Curtis comes from Pinkton, which is in the southern tip of Taiwan, uh, where there are uh, uh, several indigenous tribes there. And uh, uh, hunting issue in Taiwan is right now a very hot issue. And uh, as a hunter myself, um, hunting issues some, could be sometimes pretty crazy for non-hunting people. <laughs> and uh, I anticipate that this issue would be pretty unique too. And, as a, and also I have to tell you that uh, it seems Taiwan is right now experiencing a blackout, a power shortage, a power blackout. So may, I, Hopefully not, but maybe his presentation will be interrupted by uh, the electric uh, troubles. But, uh, uh, oh, there's someone. 
so is Professor Curtis there? Hello? Oh, as I said, maybe he is out by this blackout. Um, what shall I do? The Modi or Earl? Is he uh, uh, is he completely out? Y yes, uh, Professor is not here. Maybe we can move to the next presentation if that's okay. Yeah, I think we have to do so. Um, Ichikawa san, daijoubu desu ka? Ano, nanka, teden ga atte, ano, Taiwan tsunagan nai. Wakarimashita. Ii desu ka? Okay, um, then, um, so this is an emergency. We have to uh, move to presentation three. So we will hopefully come back to presentation two after afterwards but we would like to move to presentation three and presentation three is from morihiro ichikawa at tomamu law office in japan and uh, he is a lawyer in hokkaido japan and he's in council for the ainu tribes and he also does environmental law and uh, as i briefly mentioned about the uh, situation in the united states they have a treaty among between the gov uh, national government and the tribes, but that is not always always what happens in, in other countries. I guess most, I guess the majority of the countries do not have such treaties between the indigenous people, and that is also the case in Japan too. And um, his presentation will be comments from the perspective of Japan's Ainu salmon case. And uh, he will be presenting in his uh, in Jap Japanese language, so I will translate. Okay, uh, Ichikawa san, ja, eto, onegai itashimasu. Hai, arigatou gozaimasu. Eto, mazu, ima yatte iru jiken, sono sake no mondai de wa, la poro ainu nation te yu shudan ga tokachi gawa kakoubu de no sake o jiu ni torase ro. 取る権利があるっていうことを国にも求めているサイバンということです。あのパワーポイント先生だけ。あ、もうムーブとパワーポイント。あ、ごめんなさい。パワーポイント、パワーポイント。オープス。見えてないです。あ、ごめんなさい。はい。じゃあこれをえっとプレゼンテーションモードにしますね。で、2番目の地図をお願いします。はい。え、北海道と北海道ですが、え、トカトカチガワあの示してもらえますか？So this is Hokkaido Japan and Ainu no yoiki te kore gurai de indesu ka? Hai. This is where the Ainu indigenous people uh, range and this is Tokachi where the uh, where he is now uh, uh, working on a lawsuit. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, working on a lawsuit uh, about uh, a salmon case of, for the Ainu people right here. Hi. Around here. The sake hokakken ga aru っていう根拠はあの Ainu の歴史になります。So, fishing はい、salmon currently fishing salmon by the Ainu indigenous people is only allowed by the government by permission for ceremony using uh, traditional gear, and uh, they are right. The Ainu are right. Ainu's Raporo Nation is right now suing the government uh, to have their fishing rights recognized. その根拠は歴史に遡ります。で、百五十年前まではえ、先ほどの北海道島は。当時のエドバクフですね徳川将軍からすると外国扱いをされてましたそれで、so、the, the rationale of the claim 
uh, is uh, backed up by the history. So before 150 years ago, that's when there were samurais out there and ruling the, uh, the shogun was ruling Japan. At that time, Hokkaido was uh, uh, deemed to be a foreign nation. どうぞ。はい。で、外国扱いされた北海道でえ、アイヌ集団はもう無数に古端と言われている集団が無数にあったんですが、それぞれあの独立国家としてえ、支配領域を持ち、裁判もそれぞれの集団でやっているま、いわ
一切あの無視していて、無視っていうのは応答してこないんですね、裁判で。あのまあ、認否をしてこないんですけれども、あのまあ、そういう中で、なんとか国際法に基づいて、それと、まあ、基づいて、えー、歴史を復活させたいということで、あのー、ラポルの皆さんが頑張っているという裁判です。And the Japanese government、uh, ignores、uh, our question about、uh, the history of the Ainu people's rights. So we're now fighting、uh, to have the government recognize the history and their rights. And that is the law case we are now working on. The Imano Tokoro, Ano, Ainu no Senju can this name, Koyu, Saka Hokak can, O Motomeru, Tino, Kore, Kesu, Tosta, Ikoska, Nine, Deskeredomo, Ano, Okuno, Ainu, Stachiga, Chumoko, Ste, Imas. Currently, this is the only case in Japan, the only law case in Japan,、uh, which are suing for the fishing, fishing rights. But、uh, many of the Ainu people are uh, uh, interested in taking a careful eye on this、uh, issue in this case. というのも、あの日本政府はもはや。サケ捕獲権をはじめとする先住権を持つ主体となる集団は日本には存在しないということが日本政府の公式見解になっているので各地で実はあの集団というのが実際はあるんですけれどもそういう集団の人たちが注目しているということになります。Since the Japanese government's official stance is that there are no traditional、um, communities and right bearers anymore existing, existent in Hokkaido. But uh, if the uh, court rules otherwise, it will, be, it will give a, a great、um, uh, paradigm shift、uh, to the other Ainu、uh, communities, which、uh, do.、Uh, Have certain extent do have a connection with the、uh, traditional cottons. The Masayo Narimasa Laporo no Minasan wa Sake Hokaken wo Kunini Mitome Saseta Ue de Ima Sake Shingen na Monosmoku Kekingen Steel Nakade Sake Shingen wo do Hosen Steaknoka. 特に農薬の使用,使用とかですね、えー、河川の改修とかに対して、えー、正当に意見を言っていく権利を主張していきたいというふうに思っています。And I also want to add that the Rapporo Nations I knew are not just looking to fish in the river. But、uh, they are very concerned about the environmental、um, de degradation of the uh, environment of which the salmon lives in. So,、uh, when upon the recognition of the fishing rights, the Rapporo Nation、uh, is looking forward、uh, to step in、uh, to the management of the salmon and also coping with the.、Uh, Construction in the rivers.、Uh, there are a lot of constructions going on、uh, in the river and developments, and also uh, to uh, regulate the uh, agricultural uh, chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. So they want to、uh, take, take a share in the, the management of the salmon resource, which are depleting right now. はいでまあ、最後に写真をちょっと見ていただきたいんですが、どれですかこれ最初あそのもう一個前あ、さっき説明していただきましたが、あのこれが十勝川の河口で、向こうに見えるのが太平洋です。うん、this is the river mouth of Tokachi River, and this is the Pacific Ocean in the background. で、大体、えー、サイトとしては、この河口から、10キロぐらい上流部までの河口部で鮭を取りたいと。で、今取っているのは、許可を得て
200匹、あ、うん、200匹か。200匹まで、えー、取っていいっていう許可で取っている様子です。And they are right now、uh, suing the government to have the rights from the river mouth up to about 10 kilometers,、uh, three or four, three miles upstream. And they're claiming this site、uh, for fishing. And right now,、uh, the, the fish, fishing photograph here is done under the permis-、uh, permit of the government, national,、uh, the provincial government. And they're only allowed to take 200 salmon. Each and can this come? Eh, I know, two hundred salmon in one season,、uh, one year, which is the season is only for two months. でこれを本当は自由に取りたいっていう裁判をやってます。But they, but it, uh, で、次の写真が、はい、これがこれが最初に取れた鮭を祝うアイヌの伝統儀式です。This is, this photograph is of, of the ceremony of the first, first salmon. So they do this do ceremony when the First salmon is taken in the season.、Uh, the gentleman sitting on, in the, with the yellow、uh, coat is Sashima, Mr. Sashima, the chief of the Rapolo Nation. こういうあの最初に取れた鮭を祝う儀式をしながら、えー、その後に自由に。取れる権利がないっていう矛盾を抱えているのです。Uh, though, uh, catch, um, uh, freely, uh, ということで、時間短すぎましたか<笑>いやいやあとあの、道具とかどうなんですかあの伝統的な両方っていうのは。ああのその許可をする側はあの伝統的な森でって言ってくるんですが、彼らは、うん、あの網漁をしています。And also there's an issue about the traditional gear which、uh, is used for this、uh, fishing under permission. So the government、uh, requires、uh, that the Ainu should use a spear. Uh, according to the tradition. However, the Ainu themselves right now are not using uh, uh, are using the nets、uh, to catch a salmon because that is more uh, e- uh, easier to catch. And there is also this uh, uh, debate between what kind of gear they can use for fishing. えー、1888年に掘り出されて大学に持つ持ち去られた遺骨返還の時に、mm-hmm. あのその返還、うん、訴訟で返還させた遺骨と合わせて、えー、網を修理する道具というのが副葬品として出てきたので、mm-hmm. あの彼らは先祖は網を使って漁をしていた。いう確信を持っているので、網を使って今漁をしています。And also the Ainu believes that using nets are also、uh, does not contradict with the tradition because、um, there, there's also a case uh, uh, because in, in 1888、uh, there is a specimen in the university、uh, from From the Ainu tribe, that the Ainus and that、uh, specimen, uh, that, that uh, historical uh, uh, object is our kit to fix the fishing nets. Thus,、uh, that's the evidence that、uh, the Ainu back in the 19th century were using the nets. By the way, this net was in the university with the bones of the Ainu people and the、uh, 市川さん、その返還保証の話、ちょっとだけしてくれます。はい。えっ、ー、と、19世紀後半から、えー、一番新しくて1965年まで
日本の12の大学が、えー、アイヌの各地の墓地から遺骨を合計1600体ばかり掘り出して、えー、保管していました。By the, way, this, uh, uh, by the way, speaking about the universities, in Japan, 12 universities collected uh, 1, 000,、uh, 1,600 uh, uh, bodies of the Ainu from, from, gra from traditional graves and,、uh, as、uh, scientific、uh, research. And that happened from the late 19th century, even, even to 1965, like those. でその遺骨返還、ラポロ・アイル・ネーションは、えー、北海道大学を含めて3大学に遺骨返還の訴訟を起こして110体、約110体の遺骨返還に成功しました。And the Rapolo Nation、uh, filed a lawsuit for the recovery of these、uh, bodies and bones, and they got about 110 back. And that law case was also uh, uh, done by uh, Ichikawa himself. Okay, and so、uh, thank you very much. And、uh, this was the second presentation. Thank you. So,、uh, can So,、uh, the Ainus do not have any treaties at all, and they're just, their rights are just denied.、Uh, so, Professor Curtis is not here yet for shortage? Not yet. Not yet. Okay,、uh, too bad, but、uh, I guess then we have to skip and move to position four.、Uh, position four would be、um, by.、Uh, Tiffany、uh, Gardner, and this issue is、uh, on water. So,、um, so Tiffany is a first year、uh, Jewish doctor student at the University of Western Australia.、Uh, and for her undergraduate studies,、uh, Tiffany majored in law and society and chemistry. And last year, she completed her law and society honors degree. And her research comes from a social legal background and focuses on the indigenous government rights in the context of environmental law. And as myself, I'm also、uh, one of the directors of,、uh, I mean,、uh, as myself, I'm also, uh, uh, I've also studied、um, law and society. So I'm very excited to hear what Tiffany has to.、Uh, Give today, and her presentation today will be recognizing the strength in first law co governance as a strategy for water decolonization.、Uh, so, uh, Tiffany, please,、uh, your presenter. Thank、please、you. Thank you. I'll just share my screen so I hope everyone can see that now. Yes, looks、yeah. good. Yes. Look good. Okay, so yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany, and I'm very pleased to be presenting to you today from Perth in Western Australia about my socio legal honours research on the involvement of Indigenous peoples in freshwater co governance. Before I get started, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Wajak Noongar land and that the Wajak Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land. And continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. To give a sense of structure to this presentation, I'll begin by introducing my research focus on co governance. I'll then move on to the three main sections of the presentation. The first section will focus on the context of the Matawara. Matawara is the Aboriginal name for the Fitzroy River in Western Australia. Which is pictured here on the slide. And it's really the main case study of my research. The second section will build on this context by looking at the governance aspirations of the Indigenous traditional owners of the Matawara area and the council that they have formed to protect the river. The final section will then home in on the potential applications of co governance for the Matawara. 
by drawing comparisons with river management models in Victoria, Australia and in New Zealand. Getting straight to the core of the issue, the current legal framework in Western Australia does not ensure meaningful and equitable involvement of traditional owners in water management. Note that the term traditional owners is used here to refer to Indigenous peoples in Australia with a traditional connection to their lands and waters through their culture and law. And this may or may not be recognised through formalised native title legislation. So as a result of these problems in the legal framework, the ecological, cultural and spiritual health of significant rivers and connected peoples is suffering. My topic responds to this issue and the focus of my research is to evaluate co-governance as a strategy for water decolonisation and to consider what might be some essential features for a co-governance body to be commensurate with the governance aspirations of Matawara traditional owners. Before going much further though, it's essential to define some of the really key terms, including decolonisation, first law and co-governance, as these terms are just fundamental to understanding this content. Decolonisation refers to processes that support the undoing of colonisation through substantial changes, such as shifting power and decision-making authority to traditional owners. Water decolonisation refers to these processes in the context of water resources governance and law. First law describes the collective body of laws of First Peoples of Australia and is the term for Aboriginal customary law that is preferred by Matawara traditional owners. Co-governance refers to a hybrid system for shared decision making based on agreed principles and collaborative guidelines. And it's very importantly different from participatory management processes that would view traditional owners as just another stakeholder among many. So these three concepts interact when considering how co-governance frameworks that involve substantial recognition of first law could contribute to the decolonization of water law. Now on to discussing the historical, cultural and legal context of the Matawara. A comprehensive understanding of context is integral to this topic to allow the co-governance body to meet the needs of local community. The Matawara catchment, shown here in green, uh, covers approximately 94,000 square kilometres in the Kimberley region of northern Western Australia. And the river itself, which is shown here in blue, is one of Australia's largest. Traditional owners, scientists and politicians alike have all acknowledged that the Matawara has both local and global significance due to its ecological and cultural values. Currently, the Matawara is relatively unregulated by government policy and fairly unmodified by human development. But the continuing conservation of this river has been under threat from extractive industries development and large scale irrigated agriculture proposals. Colonization has had a significant impact on shaping the environmental, cultural and legal context of the Matawara. British colonization of Australia was underpinned by the legal fiction of Terry Nullius, which failed to recognize first law and held that Australia was an uncultivated and lawless land. This doctrine was eventually overturned in 1992, but the historical and continuing denial of first law are mechanisms of colonisation that significantly contribute to the forced assimilation and destruction of Aboriginal cultures. Aboriginal people were seen as uncivilised hunters and gatherers who had failed to utilise the natural resources surrounding them. This colonial judgment was driven by the assumption that uh, material development and capital advancement were necessary for achieving social, cultural and political progress. Systemic violence was facilitated and justified through settler state legislation and meant that Aboriginal people were forbidden to speak their own language, practice their own laws or remain meaningfully connected to their own country. The present day context of the Matawara is influenced by the main water interests. Pastoralists have an increasingly ambitious water extraction interest in the Matawara. 
Pastoral farming is the main land use of the catchment. And despite previous irrigation projects being largely unsuccessful, pastoralists are still applying for large water licenses intended for mass irrigated agriculture. These development proposals are accompanied by a narrative of providing an economic lifeline for Aboriginal communities, and they're equated with pursuing a greater good. However, this narrative fails to acknowledge the large environmental and sociocultural trade-offs. Environmental groups have a water protection interest in the Matawara due to its unique hydrology and ecology. This includes wetlands of international significance, as well as many endemic and endangered species. The Matawara itself has highly fluctuating and unpredictable water flows and the interactions of the Matawara groundwater and surface water systems are very complex and still not fully understood. So this means that environmentalists have great concern that any kind of increase to the water extraction could have unforeseen and detrimental environmental outcomes. The water interests of Matawara traditional owners are significant and stem from pre-existing cultural, spiritual, environmental, and economic relationships with the river. Traditional owners are not necessarily anti-development though. Just under half of the pastoral stations in the catchment are under Aboriginal ownership or management. But most traditional owners wish to see development that prioritizes sustainability and river and community health. Water law in Western Australia is outdated and has minimal regard for, oh, sorry. Yep. Excuse me, I was just looking at the chat. Water law in Western Australia is outdated and has minimal regard for pre-existing Indigenous water interests or rights, as I've just spoken about. Water allocation plans in Western Australia set out the total amount of water that can be extracted from a water resource. Uh, and these are non-statutory, so they just offer a guide and they have weak enforceability. Cultural heritage legislation and native title law also provide limited opportunities for meaningful involvement in governance processes or recognition of Aboriginal water rights. The state government of Western Australia is currently involved in fulfilling election promises in relation to the Matawara. These include the creation of specific water allocation plans and a catchment management plan. But both plans are going to be non-statutory and the action taken towards them so far is still operating on a fundamental stakeholder model that does not provide sufficient recognition to first law and is unable to support the governance aspirations of traditional owners. I'll now move on to present what the governance aspirations of traditional of Matawara traditional owners are. Now, this content has been drawn from published documents and films created by Matawara traditional owners. And this section of my research was conducted through an ethics approved consultative review process with their organization, the Matawara Council. Indigenous peoples have inherited, connected with and communicated first law for tens of thousands of years. First law is about sustainable harmony and is intrinsically linked to the land. Matawara first law includes Wunan law, which is a regional governance system that balances respect for the sovereignty of individual traditional owner groups with coordinated management of country as an indivisible living system. Wallangari law understands the river as a sacred ancestral being that both gives life and has an inherent right to life. Central to this Matawara first law is the concept of living waters, which describes the permanent waters inhabited by spiritual beings or water snakes. Traditional owners are closely connected to these living waters and identify as river people, guardians who are bound by law to protect the Matawara's right to life. The maintenance of living waters is also central to community well-being as it fosters relationships of reciprocity and care between people and place. For traditional owners, the living waters of the Matawara are communal and have immeasurable value. This contrasts resource-focused perspectives that view water in terms of extraction value. So traditional owners were moved by their concerns about the impact that proposed development would have on the environmental and cultural values of the river. 
So in 2018, six traditional owner nations collaborated to establish the Matawara Fitzroy River Council. And it was to be a cultural governance body for the purpose of implementing the Fitzroy River Declaration. Now this declaration is an important statement agreed upon by traditional owners as a representation of their first law in modernity. And it presents the understanding of the Matawara as a living ancestral being with a right to life. So central to these governance aspirations of the Matawara Council is the co-design of legislation specific to the Matawara and the establishment of a statutory co-governance authority for catchment management. These aspirations are accompanied by the expectation that the collaborative decision-making processes will be conducted in accordance with the highest standard of free, prior and informed consent, as it is set out in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The new legislative framework must recognise the Matawara Council as a key legal and cultural entity, more influential than a stakeholder, and with stronger rights than their current right to comment on proposed reform. Effective engagement of all parties with the co-design process can also provide an opportunity to acknowledge the impact of Aboriginal water dispossession and to promote Aboriginal water justice by supporting the governance aspirations of Matawara traditional owners. I'll now just move into the final section discussing the potential co-governance models. So to identify the essential features of a co-governance body for the Matawara, I conducted a comparative analysis by drawing on related legal developments from similar jurisdictions. Victoria in Australia and Ottawa in New Zealand provided suitable case studies because they both reformed the management of a significant river by taking steps towards co-governance back in 2017. The Birrarung in Victoria was given an independent voice through the statutory creation of the Birrarung Council, which ensures a degree of co-governance by requiring a proportion of its members to be traditional owners. Te Awatapua in New Zealand became the first instance of a specific natural feature being recognised as a legal person. And this created a system of co-governance between Maori and government authorities. So I took these two contexts and compared them using the following three functional questions. The first question looked at the constitution and formation of the body. The second question looked at its participation in existing legal frameworks. And the third focused on the principles that would guide the actions of the body. To answer these questions in relation to the Birrarung and Te Awatapua, um, I examined them and compared them. And then importantly, I drew out conclusions from these comparisons to apply back to the Matawara context. And it's those conclusions that I've drawn out to be expressly relevant to the Matawara that I'll be presenting to you now. So it's important that traditional owners' ancestral legal claims to water stewardship are recognised as more significant than a stakeholder interest through equitable co-governance with the settler state. The composition of the Matawara co-governance body needs to be able to support Indigenous peoples to have a direct and procedurally powerful voice. To achieve this, methods such as proportionally significant membership, additional voting requirements or veto powers might be used. The composition and formation of the body should be refined through a co-design process with traditional owners. The comparative analysis also brought up some interesting points about the potential for executive or government membership. In the case of the Matawara co-governance body, it might actually be beneficial to have some members be from government. This is because Matawara traditional owners are seeking to co-design a body with executive powers that both supports and is relevant to first law and also settler state law. To achieve the governance aspirations of Matawara traditional owners, the co-governance body would need to extend to these executive roles that have enforceable decision-making powers on catchment management without being limited by a reliance on existing settler state frameworks. A legally binding Matawara strategy that is designed and enforced by the co-governance body would be central to these aspirations. 
This would challenge settler state assumptions about water governance frameworks and look for more transformative opportunities for first law to engage in bicultural reform. This will create an interstitial legal structure that's neither a purely Indigenous nor purely settler state entity, and that recognises that a fully functioning system needs to incorporate aspects of both. However, such hybrid legal spaces, particularly in circumstances of inequitable power relationships, carry the risk that the dominant settler state system will subsume and co-opt the first law system. On the one hand, this presents the challenge of retaining the transformative potential of first law within the settler state paradigm. Yet on the other, it also presents an opportunity to achieve constructive and legal pluralist co-governance. The Matawara co-governance body would need to be underpinned by a series of statutory principles informed strongly by first law. Whether these would take a rights of nature approach is something that should remain open for traditional owners to consider and decide upon. The rights of nature featured more strongly in my research and I have not yet spoken about it much because it can become quite theoretical and tangential. However, it is important to briefly flag it as a relevant issue here. The rights of nature refers to a movement in environmental law towards recognising nature as having legal personhood or having a legal standing with enforceable rights. These theories are often said to have a significant affinity with Indigenous worldviews. However, their relationship and compatibility with first law is very complex. Even if the Western Australian government adopted a rights of nature approach to the Matawara, there remains ambivalence among Matawara traditional owners as to the appropriateness and the usefulness of such an approach. This is because concepts of rights and legal personhood are distinctly Western and may sit uncomfortably with traditional owners for representing their sacred spiritual ancestor. Whilst the rights of nature approach may not offer sort of a groundbreaking standalone legal avenue for co-governance, where it is supported by traditional owners, it may be useful for offering a legal and conceptual bridge between first law and settler state law that can stimulate a conversation between these two systems around caring for country. This presentation has explored the potential for co-governance to advance water decolonisation. It has recognised the complexity of the Matawara context and concluded that while there are competing water interests, the Matawara is more than just a valuable river to traditional owners. It's a sacred ancestral being that has a right to life, to live and flow under first law. Traditional owners have an ancestral legal claim to river governance, and they're not simply stakeholders with an interest in the Matawara. The current settler state frameworks and the proposed trajectory for reform are unable to support the governance aspirations of traditional owners. What is instead required to achieve these governance aspirations is Matawara specific legislation and a statutory Matawara co-governance body with legitimacy under both first law and settler state law. The rapidly evolving Matawara context presents us with a critical opportunity for proactive reform to regulate economic development to be environmentally and culturally beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Yeah, um, it seems to be a very, very um, a big issue. Yeah, um, seems to be very, very um, informative. And also uh, as a history of, from the history of Australia, the Aboriginal people were really, uh, uh, really uh, persecuted and it's uh, so, want to know how um, they're going to uh, take management of this water resource from now. But in the meanwhile, uh, it seems Curtis is back now. And since the, uh, the blackout is very bad, uh, we need to have him speak uh, right now because uh, nobody knows when the electricity will go off. So Professor Curtis, uh, please, uh, your presentation, please. Curtis, can you hear us?
Oh, unfortunately, um, the signal is pretty weak. Hello? Curtis, um, I guess um, since Pro Professor uh, Curtis's uh, connection is pretty bad, we have to move on um, to the questionnaires. Would that be okay with all of you? Okay, so, um, oh, he lost uh, questions. So uh, everybody is uh, invited to, uh, to raise their questions. And since uh, we have not yet uh, received any Q and A from the participants, although we have re I have received several questions from the uh, uh, panelists, uh, but uh, any questions from the participants? Since they, uh, we don't have a hundred people, anyone can uh, just uh, turn on their mic uh, microphone and uh, speak about speak about the questions. Feel free. Well, um, in the meanwhile, um, I have received several questions from uh, the panelists and also the organizers. So from uh, the, our organizer, um, Guy Charlton, uh, I have received a question uh, on regarding the traditionality uh, of uh, hunting and fishing. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have Curtis uh, Pay's uh, presentation today, but his presentation would have been an issue about the, uh, the traditional gear for traditional hunting. So Guy, could you um, uh, speak about your question here? Uh, thanks, Mitsu. Uh, uh, Ichikawa-san talked about the traditional gear in uh, the Ainu situation involving his litigation. And I, uh, I know that Anne has worked or encountered that issue with uh, Glyphwick. And I'm wondering if she could speak to that issue and then we could hear more about the problem that's facing Ichikawa and the Ainu in Haikato. Okay, then uh, Anne, can you address this question? Sure. Um, fortunately, in the U.S., there had been quite a bit of case law, actually, even before um, the the case that the tribes brought in Wisconsin. But one of the arguments that the state made and one of the sort of rallying cries for people who oppose tribal fishing rights, particularly, was that they should use traditional, only the traditional things they had at treaty time. And so even though the tribes spear fish and continue to spear fish, which is the one of the tradi traditional methods of taking fish, instead of using torches, they used headlamps. And there was an argument that they shouldn't be able to use headlamps, that they should only be able to use the, you know, the things that were available in 1842 or 1837 when the treaties were signed. But the courts um, here have disposed of that pretty quickly. And I, I just looked up quickly um, the language they said the, the plaintiffs, the tribes, are not confined to the hunting and fishing methods their ancestors relied upon at treaty times. The method of exercise of the right is not static. Plaintiffs may take advantage of improvements in the hunting and fishing techniques they employed in 1842. So there is precedent, certainly in the United States at least, that um, the, the methods can evolve. And you know, I mean, that only makes sense. The methods that non-tribal non people are using to um, fish and take deer, um, you know, they're all, they've got fish finders and all sorts of things that were not available in the mid to 1800s. So if they're not gonna be stuck um, in time, then the tribe shouldn't be stuck in time either. Thank you. So um, the court recognizes that uh, the traditional fishing can do with improvements. So would that be okay with you, Guy? And it seems that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I was wondering if you could maybe ask 
Ichikawa to elaborate a little bit more on on that issue with the Ainu. And is that, in his view, it, do they have to use traditional methods now for the 200 salmon? And is part of the claim not to use traditional methods going forward? Ichikawa-san, okay. yoroshii desu ka? あの、あの、え、その、え、漁法についての伝統的な云々という制約というのはどのようになっているのですか。もうちょっと詳しく教えてください。はい。えっと、政府側はま、あの、北海道庁になるんですけれども、あの、あくまで、え、許可は伝統儀式の保存
great reliance on the science, both Indigenous science and sort of your Western conception of science. Um, and I think it is a mobilising factor for traditional owners in seeking these co-governance arrangements. And I would also hope that it's a mobilising factor to support the sort of settler state arrangements to also seek um, more of a co-governance arrangement. How an am amenable the government may be to this is questionable. I think progress is being made. You're now starting to see um, sort of perhaps more consultation than there once might have been. However, it's about how the consultation is framed. It's still framed from very much um, sort of a, a necessary part of process and procedure, but perhaps something that doesn't have substantive impact on the outcome of what the government's actually deciding. So it's about trying to create a more equitable model that would see like a more equal dialogue between the two systems. So I think co-governance um, as a notion is still very aspirational, um, but I think the just the mobilisation of traditional owners in the past few years has been incredible. Um, and they are publishing documents and absolutely campaigning for uh, greater recognition. Um, and I mean, a move towards co-governance is just one option that's open to them. Um, but I think it's a very exciting area and one that I sincerely hope the state government of Western Australia will consider uh, going into the future. Thank you. Okay. And please. Um, I would absolutely agree with what Tiffany said about um, climate change being a mobilizing force. It's a huge topic of conversation here. It's something we are working quite a bit on. Um, uh, we have a climate change program that we didn't have before. Um, and um, within that program, we have been doing a vulnerability assessment of various species that are important to tribes and trying to think about how vulnerable they are to climate change. Um, you know, our tribes always remind us that they are located on reservations and they cannot get up and follow um, natural resources if those resources migrate to the north. Um, and so climate change is a huge issue. So in, and in addition to this vulnerability assessment, as soon as that's done, we'll be starting to work on a climate adaptation plan. Um, the tribes are working very much with other governments on these things. They have been talking to um, the Forest Service, um, the US Forest Service and our member tribes have a memorandum of understanding that talks about how they will gather forest products within the national forests for national forests within the US. And the tribes have been talking to the Forest Service for a number of years about their concerns about birch trees, because birch is a traditional um, material that was used for baskets and for writing and for a variety of, of uses and birch are very much threatened by climate change. And so they've been talking to the Forest Service for quite a while about how the Forest Service might manage its forests differently to try to promote birch where it still may be able to um, grow successfully. I think one area in the future that we will probably start talking with the Forest Service much more about is managing for carbon sequestration rather than well, maybe, and how to balance that with the amount of timber harvest that goes on within the national forests, because a lot of timber harvest goes on within the national forests, um, but they're also potentially a, a great way to sequester carbon. I think that's one of the areas that we haven't really gotten into yet, but probably will in the future. Thank you very much. And so I wanna add, um, tell, some several of the participants uh, seems to be uh, Japanese speaking people. So this is a, a special offer. You can place your question in Japanese and I can translate that. Okay, thank you, Anne. Uh, it seems like uh, climate change is a big issue in, in the uh, areas of indigenous people. Um, yeah, because uh, indigenous people uh, uh, tend to be locked up in places where the climate is not as favorable as uh, the where the dominant people are. So I assume there'll be a lot of um, consequences of the global clim climate. So um, may I ask a question to Tiffany? Um, so um, you talked about first law and uh, traditional owners. 
And I think those um, notions are uh, unique to, well, I, I think those terms are Australian ta terms, but could you um, briefly um, um, touch on that? So, because we're not necessarily familiar with the situation in Australia. Of course, yeah. So um, I think, as I said, traditional owners um, is a term that's used, uh, it, that was used in my presentation to refer to um, Aboriginal people with a, a connection to their land through their law and their culture. Uh, and I was using the term quite broadly, not just to be limited to people who may have um, a native title recognition. Um, so native title is legislation that we have in Australia that um, can give Aboriginal people rights um, to land. It's sort of a way of recognising their pre-existing land rights. However, uh, questionable about how well it does that. So yeah, so traditional owner is, is a broad term that's used to refer to Aboriginal people in Australia with a strong connection to their land, their ancestral land, and it, and it gives them an ancestral legal claim to their land. Um, first law um, is, is a term that's used, and it, you can also use the term like Aboriginal customary law or First Nations law. So it's referring to the legal systems um, and the laws that have existed for Aboriginal people in Australia for tens of thousands of years. Um, and these laws can be unique to certain groups of traditional owners, but you also see common themes between different groups. So for instance, uh, for the Matawara, we, there, I talked about um, Wunan law, which is about sort of a regional governance system. And that was about coordinating trade between different groups of traditional owners across vast spaces. Um, for the purpose of also caring for the river in a holistic manner. And I think some of those principles, um, sort of settler state law in Australia can really learn from um, because they're really good and quite effective. Um, and one other point I will just say on the climate change issue is it's quite interesting in the Kimberley where um, some climate change models predict that there'll be a vast increase in rainfall some predict there'll be a significant decrease. So it's interesting to see that there's sometimes an attitude of banking on the fact that rainfall will increase, um, which is quite concerning because as we know, climate change modeling can be really unpredictable. Um, we know that climate change will have a significant impact, but exactly what that will be, we don't know. So I think taking a precautionary approach there is really important. Uh, and I think there can be a lot to learn from traditional owners and from first law in respects to that. Thank you very much. Professor Curtis, you ready? Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Then I guess yeah. we, uh, please go on because we don't know when the electricity will go out again, so. Right, I'm, I'm truly sorry. No, uh, no problem. Yeah, uh, hold on a second. Let me, let me finish, start my PowerPoint. Yes, please. Uh, Or maybe, yeah. maybe your uh, signal is, okay, go ahead. Yeah, is, is my signal? Is weak. It's weak, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that. No, it's okay. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I am going to share with you, uh, it, is my vote okay? Yeah, good. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to share with you the, the progress of the indigenous hunting management in Taiwan in recent years. And uh, this is Taiwan that maybe most of you already knows where is Taiwan, but this is the landscape of Taiwan we have. Next slide. Big mountains. Hello? Yeah, good. Okay, okay, we have big mountains and uh, the highest peak is 4,000 meters above sea levels. And so it's, it's very rugged and uh, we have more than 100 peaks above 3,000 meters in elevations. And we also have a, a 
much lower mountain range is on the east coast, and uh, the highest peak is only 1,500 uh, meters above sea levels. So uh, this is the conceptual distribution of the traditional territories of the Taiwanese indigenous communities in Taiwan. And uh, I show that only in the mountain areas, uh, mainly because the lowland uh, has been uh, occupied by Han Chinese in the past uh, two to 300 years. Uh, so uh, most of the indigenous territories in the lowland areas um, uh, is the areas has been uh, was uh, has uh, had been occupied by Han Chinese until today. Uh, but in the mountain areas that the indigenous communities are still pretty much like the figures I show you, that they separate into very small uh, 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 patches. Uh, and uh, each patches has pretty much has a uh, uh, communities that in charge of the utilization of the natural resources within the patches. And so, and these patches, I call them the uh, traditional territories. And each te uh, traditional territory is managed by uh, communities or a group of hunting activities also within the three uh, days that the uh, government of Taiwan since 1949. And uh, at that time, uh, the Han Chinese government, the present so-called, uh, the present Republic of China government uh, adopt the Hunting Act uh, established uh, in China back to uh, 1930. Uh, the Hunting Act was the major wildlife management uh, uh, laws for sports and the recreational huntings, and everybody can hunt uh, at that time. And then in 1973, that the government, the Han Chinese government, control on the firearms, so they they suspend hunting act, uh, mainly because that uh, using hunting uh, the firearms to hunt is uh, allowed. Uh, in the Hunting Act. So the government don't, don't want to have any firearms uh, possessed by the people. So he, oh, he's out, he's a lost link. Okay, um, unfortunately it seems that uh, uh, we lost him again. So um, seeing this slide, um, so the government in 1973 uh, banned all hunting and later, later when the uh, in and the government policy started to recognize indigenous rights. Um, several statutes were enacted. And, uh, and in, in, in 1989, um, the indigenous ceremonial hunting was um, put in law. And then in 2004, it was extended uh, to allow traditional hunting uh, by the indigenous people. But, and by saying traditional hunting by the indigenous people, um, it required 
the indigenous people to use their homemade guns. Oh, he's back again. Um, sorry for the uh, wait. Uh, Professor Curtis, your um, microphone is off. Go ahead, please. So, um, Professor Curtis. So, uh, in uh, 2016, the President Tsai Ing-wen uh, officially apologized to Taiwan's indigenous population for centuries of mistreatment. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, can you hear the? Uh, yes. can, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, yes, we can see him and we can hear you. Yes. Go. Okay, uh, but I cannot see my. Uh, yeah, my yeah go ahead, please. Oh, sorry for that. Yeah, uh, right now, the 12, 12 yeah. district down so, the street. Uh, right, okay. Uh, okay, now uh, we have uh, so. After so in 2016, after the the Chai Ing Wen president, uh, um, Professor Curtis, can you send us the um? P, uh, PowerPoint by email. Well, I guess that's. Uh, I guess we sh should hopefully invite Professor Curtis next week because uh, it seems the island of Taiwan right now is uh, recognizing a big blackout. Um, this is the news right now. Can you see it? Taiwan hit by a widespread power outage. Thus, it seems like a big problem there. And I guess uh, when it is not feasible to uh, continue with this situation. So um, unfortunately, um, we have to uh, shift his presentation to hopefully next week. And uh, just to sort of uh, added information, um, the uh, homemade uh, homemade gun case. Uh, there was this person. Uh, there was a law case uh, decided by the Supreme Court last year in Taiwan that uh, uh, regarding uh, some so-called poaching by the indigenous people. And uh, although the indigenous person was using a homemade gun, he shot a he took a protected animal. And, and there was a, a controversy uh, and uh, it went up to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court ruled that uh, even though uh, the uh, hunter was an indigenous person and he had an indigenous uh, right to hunt, but still uh, he has to obey the wildlife law because uh, it is for the conservation of the animals, wildlife. And, and so he was uh, uh, charged, uh, a criminal charge. But however, the president uh, pardoned him. Uh, I guess that was last year, was it? Yeah. And uh, so that was the end of the case, but there's a lot, lot of debate uh, between the conservationists and the indigenous people uh, on what kind of, although the conservationists uh, recognize the indigenous people's rights to hunt, but still, uh, there should be a level of conservation. So there is uh, talk between the conservationists and the indigenous, indigenous tribes on which extent the traditional hunting should be done. And, uh, and Professor Curtis, I believe, is working on the project to how to uh, uh, harmonize the indigenous hunting and the conservation of the wildlife there. And unlike the Japanese archipelago, uh, the Taiwan island, island of Formosa is also very rich with biodiversity, but it's still an island. So uh, it needs a very careful management, uh, conservation management, because island tends to be small. You know? 
So uh, hopefully we'll have him next week. Um, any questions on on today's presentations? Are we okay? Uh, I, I apologize for the uh, inconveniences uh, with for the uh, but uh, we cannot fight the power blackouts. So. <laughs> Pardon me for that. So would that be okay if we uh, turn to uh, have uh, a last word from the, uh, the four pa of three panelists and also from the organizer Guy Charlton from University of New England? Okay. So then, uh, then Anne, Ichikawa, and uh, Tiffany and Guy, your la your thoughts and uh, ideas. Or, yeah, and Guy, if you have anyone you want to invite to uh, say a comment, you're welcome to. Do so. I guess um, I can go first. Uh, yes, you know, what's, what strikes me about all of this, these panels, uh, is just how common the issues are across the world, whether it's the issue of traditional gear. Um, here we talk about, you know, co-management and co-management agreements. Um, so similar to what Tiffany is talking about, it just um, conservation of species and, and whether tribes can take um, species that are already rare. So many of these issues are so common around between indigenous people all around the world. And I think it's just, it's fascinating for me to hear um, from other folks who are really fighting the exact same battles that we've been fighting over here. So I just appreciate everyone's perspectives. Thanks. Thank you very much. So may we have uh, Ichikawa-san? いや、最後の一言。あの、ありがとうございます。あの、なかなかアイヌのことは、あの、世界には知られていないので、あの、こういう機会を通じてアイヌのことを多くの世界の人に知ってもらいたいと思っています。ありがとうございました。Thank you very much. Um Ainu people are uh, uh very very uh, not not well uh Inform. I mean, not a lot of people around the world know about the Ainu people. So I would like to take, I'm taking every uh, advantage to uh, let the whole wide world world know about our Ainu people. And I hope you guys get uh, acquainted with Ainu people. Thank you very much. Tiffany, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think everything that's been said already is just absolutely right. And I would only add that I think um, it is really encouraging to hear from lots of different people all around the world who are trying to uh, campaign for better recognition of um, Indigenous rights in to whether it's with hunting or with governance or anything like that and also just recognizing the fact that we are at a really important point in time given climate change and you know the rights of nature movement and I think it's great if we can try and sustain this level of energy and uh, mobilization and support um, various groups of people to to really achieve their governance aspirations essentially thank you Thank you very much. Thank you for all that dynamic, uh, raising the dynamic issues. Thank you very much. And last but not the least, uh, we would have our organizer, Guy Charlton. Uh, we can't hear you. Turn your microphone. Ah, yes. yes. That's the, that is the, what is the word of the year? You need to, we can't hear you, the sentence of the year. Um, <laughs> with COVID, I, I would like to thank everyone um particular uh for their time in doing this i know and it's up late you're late there uh and uh it's always it's always a pleasure to listen to other people's experiences and 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 i want to congratulate you mitsu on and uh, on have uh going through swimmingly through these problems with the blackout in taiwan one of the things i i would like to echo uh what ann said one of the things that i found in in uh, and we're from the same area of the world, Ann and I, um, 
is it I'm struck by the commonalities of these issues that the battles that people fight both in natural resource management and recognition of their traditional laws of their traditional governing structures is similar and so there's something unique in everything every experience but at the same time there's these commonalities and I think uh, just listening to uh, people today and the the the, uh, the panel last week is there's a lot we can learn I think from each other um, and uh, I know I've learned a lot and um, and these are really uh, these are really projects of our time that we're confronted with climate change environmental degradation and one of the things that we need to do as a global society is to look to indigenous folks on how they manage natural resources because they've been successful. The models we've talked about even today are been successful uh, in managing those resources and we really need to look to that more generally. So uh, I, with, with that, I'd like to, to thank everyone uh, for their contribution to this and I really very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. And lastly, I want to thank Modi and Earl, who are technical persons here. And I, I think they were, it was pretty hectic for them because of the blackout. And then uh, I will tur I'll turn this over to Modi. I think there are some housekeeping announcements. And thank you very much. And hopefully we will meet next week. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Mitsu. And thank you, Kai, for those final words. So again, thank you to our, speak our speakers, our panelists, and our moderator for another invigorating session. Thank you for sharing everything about these various topics. And also a big thank you to our attendees here on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, if you're not following our Facebook, you can follow us at Engaged Scholarship in the Asia Pacific. We have two more sessions in this symposium coming up. Next week is session three, tenure and use rights across traditional lands and waters. If you are in Los Angeles, that will be on Wednesday, March 9th at 6 p.m. If you are in Taipei, that is 10 a.m. on March 10th, Thursday. And if you are in Sydney, Australia, that is 1 p.m. also on Thursday, March 10th. You can register for our Zoom link or you can watch the live stream on our Facebook page. Um, so again, thank you for attending this session. We do um, invite you to fill out our evaluation link where you can also receive a certificate of participation. So again, thank you everyone. Take care and see you next week. はい、ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。ありがとうございました。